Box office top 10. Oh, yes, we're doing that. Uh, at 50, Dr. Jekyll, which is not good. No, but it wasn't opening in a huge, oh, right. number, of, okay. a huge number of cinemas. I thought it was interesting. I certainly think it's uh, Eddie Izzard's best film. I thought their performance was actually the centre of the film and worked well. Uh, but beaten to number 38, Peeping Tom, the 4K restoration. Um, see last week's programme for details. Yes, with the fantastic interview with the amazing Thelma Schoon maker. If you haven't seen Peeping Tom in the cinema, it is so worth seeing it with the 4K restoration. It's fantastic. Number 20, uh, Typist, Artist, Pirate King. So Carol Morley, I think, is doing a collection of um, Q&As uh, at cinemas around the country. And as I said last week, it was a... I had I saw the film first on a link and wasn't a big fan and then saw it in a cinema with an audience and it was like watching a different film. So do go and see it and see it in a cinema. Don't wait for it to come to streaming. Uh, number 16 here and number 54 in the States is Cat Person. So I've really got, enjoyed. I've got an email here from Helen in Glasgow. Yes, so It might be that the, if at any stage you think this is giving too much away, just say... Okay. You're giving too much away. Okay, can I just say also the the, the 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 conjunction of those two titles together gives us the chance to repeat last week's film of the week, which was Typist, Artist, Pirate, King, Cat, Person. Mark and Simon says, Helen, long-term listener, occasional failed emailer. Okay. But God loves a trier. Just back from a screening of Cat Person at my okay. local world of Sydney in Glasgow. Yeah. Apart from being disappointed by the lack of cats, I found it <laughs> an interesting film and have been surprised by the swathes of very negative reviews. Have there been swathes of negative reviews? And if so, who? And, I'm just know. saying, Helen okay. in Glasgow uh, says, yeah, yeah, no, my yeah, reading of the film in the context of Margaret Atwood's quote at the beginning, yes. it, which is what? Well, the Margaret Atwood's quote is, well, men are afraid. Men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. Right, is that both protagonists were biased in their impressions of one another by these differing paranoias mm -hmm. from the outset? Margot repeatedly imagines Robert killing her, which then influences how she reacts to his text and appearance outside the cinema after the breakup. Robert imagines she is laughing at him behind his back, so misinterprets her boob pic and virginity comments, then takes the breakup as a sign that he was right all along, that she must be stringing him along, have a boyfriend and so on. Overall, as a single white mm. female who has long since shunned the hell of internet dating, I appreciated the way it showed how quickly great text chat can turn to awkwardness and ick in real life and the stress of how you would deal with that. Yeah. I can't help but wonder whether some people hate the film because it's more nuanced than the blanket men are awful message which Atwood's opening quote might suggest. Robert is not is not simply a psycho killer misogynist in inverted commas but someone genuinely hurt and confused by Margot's mixed messages who then overreacts with a very offensive text or have I got it completely wrong? No, you've got it completely right. The, the reason that the film works is because it is ambiguous throughout and... Uh, even even at the very end of the film, there are there are still you know levels of question. But I think it's a very smart portrayal of the you know the differing expectations that the two central characters have, and the way in which the, I mean we were talking about this just in relation to how to have sex. That thing about a situation can go from being this is fun to this is not fun, and to this is really dangerous in a in the blink of an eye. And and it's always the thing about is the is this something bad or am I just projecting onto it? No, I thought that email was very correct. I, I, I don't know the bad reviews. I mean, there are other reviewers. It's completely lost on me. No. I would, in fact, it's the first I've heard of it. Yeah. Other opinions. I know. Beetlejuice is at number 14, <laughs> which is amazing. I've seen The Exorcist around 167 times and it just gets funnier. Uh, UK number 10, nine in the States is Saw 10. You still haven't seen Sorks, have you? I haven't seen any of them. You're not going to, are you? I am absolutely, <laughs> you know, the world is awash with troublesome situations without watching someone being tortured for fun. No, thank you. You know it's not real, don't you? Well, you say that. <laughs> uh, you, uh, number nine here, 10 in the States is The Creator. Which we enjoyed very much, Indeed. and you can still hear our interview with the director on a previous podcast. Number eight is... Some Otherhood. Which is, you know, done fine. It's dropping out the charts now pretty fast, but it, it found its audience. I am not its audience, and I wasn't a huge fan of it, but I kind of, you know, I have a sneaking admiration for the for the fact that it, it got made and it, you know, it did exactly what it said on the tin. Number seven is uh, The Great Escaper. Which I thought was really sweet. I love the central performances by Michael Caine retired Michael Caine now, allegedly, and Glenda Jackson, largely because Glenda Jackson reminded me of my mum, but I thought it was a very, very touching story. And number six, 
Uh, here is the Exorcist Believer, number five in the States. Number five here, number six in the States. Paw Patrol, the mighty movie. It's better than the Exorcist Believer by quite some way. Number four is Taylor Swift, the era's tour. So are, we, two are we now officially Swifties? Yeah, of course. No, I, I just did, I didn't, I hadn't even heard that word until you said I it. I think it's quite possible to be a Swifty, but not particularly downloading her latest album. No, but, you, you, but, but you know, I, I tell you, if you see this film, you'll come, if, if like me, you know nothing about Taylor Swift before you see the film, you come out and thinking, well, whatever she's doing, she's doing yeah. rather brilliantly. Child 2 was, uh, couldn't get tickets to go and see a uh, concert, so went with her mates to see the movie. Um, and they were all going to do, you know, dressing up in different Taylor Swift eras. eras yes. And, you know, <laughs> that's that's fun. You know? And by, by the, the, the normal rules don't apply. I think the normal rules of cinema etiquette. If you're going to see it's a concert, a concert movie, film, yeah, yeah, then yeah. I think you can yeah. jump up and dance and sing and yeah. eat uh, popcorn. Wh whilst you were reading the previous email, I was distracted by the phone that child by the fact that child two was calling on your phone. She, she always, always calls, calls when always we're recording. It's on it's a Wednesday uncanny. morning. It's just yeah. like fortunately it didn't. I just sort of thought, no, <laughs> thought I'll get back to you. Uh, number three here, number three in the states, Killers of the Flower Moon, which is doing very very well. Um, particularly considering the length, there has been a lot of discussion recently about uh, certain cinema chains putting um, intervals in some screenings. If you go to the booking... Yeah, I think it's you, view. I think it's view. And I think if you go to... It's not all screenings. It's if you choose to have an, an interval, there is, I believe, a 15-minute intermission. Um, they were talking about it on the news this morning. There's yes. been quite a lot of discussion of it. And in fact, we've had a lot of correspondence about people saying, why isn't this possible? Because it is possible. The big problem for a long time was to do with multiplexes saying you can't have people coming out of a screen and then going back into them. But apparently you can. Okay. Well, um, I think that might be appreciated if you've yeah. got a three, you yeah. know, from a cinema's point of view, if it's yeah. three and a half hours or three and three hours and three quarters, it's not going to make a huge amount of No, it's, it, it's the, the film is, the film is long enough that, um, that, that it's, al it's already long enough to mean that you're going to be limited in how many screenings right. you can do, which means that the fact that it's at number three means it's doing very well. Number two is Trolls Band Together. Which is exactly what you would expect yes. from Trolls Band Together. Number one in the UK, number one in the United States is Five Nights at Freddy's. So my prediction was, you know, it'll go to number one for one week and then it'll drop like okay. a stone. Pablo says, I very much enjoyed Mark's review of Five Nights at Freddy's. Good. FNAF being the colloquial term. Oh, is it? Good. Yes. <laughs> Even though I knew I was going to disagree. Later that day, I went to see the film with my good friend George, the uh, both of us being big fans of the video games. Yeah. Being in our early 20s, we were the perfect age to discover the series when, we f when it first came out in 2014 and follow along with each of the now 10 plus installments. The crazy fan theories, the crazy actual plot and the work of the fan base, which is more generative than most, creating their own games, short films and stories. We absolutely adored the film and our experience in the theatre was one of the most delirious, hilarious and memorable experiences I've ever had wow. okay. in the cinema. Wow. I say this as a recent BA film production graduate. Well, we laughed and cried and cheered as our favourite elements of the series were rendered in live action, packed with Easter eggs and knowing nods, as well as genuinely interesting new developments. I just wanted to give you more of a feel of what FNAF is really about to maybe provide better context to some of the convoluted silliness. I love the film, which was clearly made for fans, but I don't believe anyone would not have a good time with a camp murder ghost melodrama that isn't afraid to mock itself into oblivion if they knew that's what they were in for rather than a genuine scary film. Uh, and Luke in Gloucestershire, I went to see Friday night at Freddy's movie. Five nights at Freddy's. Uh, okay, five <laughs> nights at Freddy's. Uh, packed late night screening, full of clearly diehard uh, fans of the franchise. I myself are not a fan, having never played the games, but I'm familiar with its trappings and I love a campy horror. Throw in some fantastic looking Jim Henson studio made practical animatronic costume puppet effects and I simply couldn't resist. Sadly, the film was something of a bore. It wasn't scary enough nor campy enough to work as I the kind of horror entertainment and whilst there are a few fun sequences there's far too many boring conversations and a complete lack of actual scares the latter is somewhat surprising since the video games are 90 percent waiting for a jump scare and 10 percent mm -hmm. the jump scares yes and I, I i'm in in tune with that second email is that i thought it wasn't anything like as much fun as it should be i would say it is worth looking at Willy's Wonderland, which is the same film made for a fifth of the money with uh, Nick Cage, who in the car this morning I referred to you as Nick Cave, which I would easy always to make. be easy, easy to do. Easy, easy, yeah. um, uh, uh, Luke's second paragraph, by yeah. the way. 
Says, oh, there's more. I'm so sorry. On your comparison with Willy's Wonderland, which again oh, I, I found surprisingly boring given the premise of Nicolas Cage fighting robot animals, yeah. <laughs> I must point out the superior robot animatronic animals on a rampage film, which is the Banana Splits movie, yeah, which, uh, which came it, out in yeah. 2019. Yes, yes, it's that Banana Splits from the 60s TV yes. show, except now they're let loose on all manner of annoying horror protagonists in gleefully gory fashion. Yeah. It ain't a masterpiece, and it's probably the cheapest of all three of these movies, but it oddly has the most heart humour and visceral creativity. If FNAF had been like this, but on a bigger budget, I'd have had a blast. Still, yes. weird that there are now three of these kind of films. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yes, but the Banana Splits movie is definitely in the same ballpark. As in tra-la-la. La-la-la-la. Tra-la-la-la-la. Who did the, the Dickies? The Dickies. They made every song sound exactly, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Doesn't matter what they did. And in fact, I was, I had a, a great version of Silent Night on white vinyl. Really? Which is exactly as you would imagine. <laughs> Very, no, 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 no. Yeah, very fast. I had a T-shirt which said "Original Dickies" because it's an it's an it's American work clothes thing. And somebody said to me, "Oh, banana splits." I went, "No, no. I, I presume that Dickies are named after that." Yeah, I don't know. Because Dickies is a, it's it's an American work clothing thing. You know, it's like Carhartt. It's you know, it's. The Carhartts is not as good as the, as, as the Dickies. As the Dickies. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. While you're here, check out all the other videos because they're cool too, aren't they? Yeah, and if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermit and Mayo's take, then check out our social channels. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I, I would. I have done. Excellent.